Kayla Kessinger. Kayla, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm intrigued to hear more about this thriller. It sounds like uh, this is going to be a bestseller in West Virginia this summer, maybe. <laughs> well, your lips to God's ear. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. John, how many, how many books have you written now? 29? Uh, I'm on my 29th. This is book I'm number writing 29. my 29th. And, and if wow. we added up all the books you've sold now, how many would that total? More than two or three dozen. <laughs> it's over a, a few million. It's over how many million? Would you say twenty nine books? Um, total cumulative around yeah, the world. If you were to guess how many, counting ebooks, I don't. I really, I, I ten fifteen million. I don't know. Ten fifteen million. Wow. Yeah, you should see his house, Kayla. It's a, it's probably more than that. That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, it's known as the Gilstrap Estate. There are armed guards at the front. <laughs> <laughs> there are turrets with snipers, and there's a no. moat. Around the around the piranha. The <laughs> that Angry. is not surprising to me. Um, somebody from yeah. the Eastern Panhandle. You guys have some of the most incredible people out there. That's for sure. Mike Hornby being one of them. Of course, I'm actually such a sad. We agree. I, uh, He's not in the room. You don't have to sure. suck up to him. I know. Actually, you know what? So he is one of the funniest people. I'm really sad I never got to serve with him because that guy keeps me in stitches. He is so funny and so smart, and I uh, I've always enjoyed him. And then also. Riley Moore is probably one of my dearest friends. Cool. You all really do. You all have some good quality folks out there in the Eastern Panhandle. We try. We try. Uh, Kayla, uh, let's talk about uh, what you're doing now. As you formerly, you were in the House of Delegates, rose to majority leader status. What uh, What is your story now? Yeah. So um, probably most people remember um, during my time in the legislature, I have always been an advocate for life. Um, uh, to protect life and empower women. And now I'm working full-time in the pro-life movement, not on the political side, um, but on the service side. And so um, I work with pregnancy health organizations, um, connecting and growing the pro-life safety net to ensure that women have access to the resources and services that they need and that they're also aware of them. So that's really uh, where my life has taken me. And it has been just an absolute joy um, to see the number of women uh, who have been served by the amazing pregnancy health organizations here in West Virginia. If you are in the pro-life movement in West Virginia right now, I would say this is a good time to be doing that because the state has certainly turned uh, very much so in that direction. Yeah, you, you honestly, you can't be more correct. Um, I was thinking about, I was actually reflecting on this a little bit um, the other day because, you know, 10 years ago, um, I was elected to the legislature for the first time um, as a very young and naive 21-year-old girl. I was elected to the House of Delegates. Um, and at that time, West Virginia, 10 years ago, just 10 short years ago, West Virginia was one of the least regulated states in the country when it came to abortion. Um, abortion on demand up until the moment of birth, paid for by taxpayer dollars in West Virginia. That was the state of abortion in West Virginia just 10 years ago. But under the leadership of the Republican Party, we've been able to chip away. The first year that the Republican Party um, took over in the state legislature, we passed the, the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act and then subsequently passed pieces of legislation continuing to protect women. Um, and that really all culminated in 2022 um, following the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade and throw it on the ash heap of history where it belongs. Um, and, and the legislature acted and acted swiftly um, to protect life um, that summer. And so we really we have gone from one extreme um, to a place where life is now protected and women are empowered. Um, and I don't want to bore your listeners with all of the ins and outs of that legislative session. But, you know, the Republican Party um, and in particularly with the current leadership in the House and the Senate, um, with Craig Blair and Roger Hanshaw has made significant strides on um, cultivating a culture of life here in West Virginia. Um, back in 2022, I remember we were going into the to the special session on life, and there were so many voices in Charleston um, who who wanted us to delay action. Um, there were people that were arguing that the election was coming up; it was too close. We would pay for it at the ballot box. We didn't, by the way. In fact, I think the Republican Party took a record number of seats in the House and the state Senate. Um, but there were all of these people who kept trying to get the state legislature to kick the can down the road. Um, and I am I'm just really incredibly grateful um, for Craig Blair and for Roger Hanshaw 
um, and their commitment to passing that piece of legislation when we did, because if we hadn't, there would have likely been hundreds, at least a hundred, if not more, unborn mountaineers um, lives cut short between the beginning of September and the end of that year. Um, and so because of them, countless lives have been saved and um, I will forever be grateful. And then of course, during that same legislative session, I was sort of tasked with this responsibility um, on what we were calling our culture of life bill. And um, that bill really was to develop um, initiatives that would empower women to choose life, sort of as an accompaniment to um, the bill to protect life legislatively. And um, I had, I, I'm picking on him a little bit because I know this is his neck of the woods, but I had, I can't even tell you how many conversations with Craig Blair where he was so excited about the possibility of West Virginia leading the way on becoming a state um, like the gold standard for pregnancy health in our country. And, and that is a promise that he has delivered on because this year um, it's in the back of the budget right now, but if the legislature um, fulfills their promise to invest $3 million this year um, into pregnancy health organizations, that will be more than the state of Georgia. And so West Virginia really is putting our stake in the ground and saying, we're going to protect life. And we're going to empower women to choose life. We're going to support the organizations who walk alongside vulnerable families. And it's really cool for me to look back at, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, And it's really cool for me to look back and see that t 10 years ago, our tax dollars were paying for abortions. Now we're investing in pregnancy health organizations. 10 years ago, abortion facilities were terminating the lives we're legally allowed to terminate the lives of unborn children up until the moment of birth, and now life is protected. And uh, there's so many people to thank for that, um, but definitely House and Senate leadership um, was at the helm the entire time. Kayla, in 2018, there was Amendment 1, which was the No yeah. Right to Abortion uh, Amendment, and 51.7% yeah. of the state were for no right to abortion. And in the Eastern mm -hmm. Panhandle, uh, Jefferson County vote at that time, this was six years ago, voted against that referendum, 56.4%. In Berkeley, 52.3% voted for it. And in Morgan, 55.8% uh, voted for it. Is there a movement to get that amendment or some sort of amendment similar to it back on an election referendum in the near future? Yeah, you're correct. Just six short years ago, um, West Virginia voters decided that we were going to put in our Constitution a very simple amendment that made it clear that nothing in our state Constitution protected a right to abortion or provided funding for abortion. Because, again, up until that point, we were paying for abortions in the state of West Virginia, um, which is just absolutely egregious on so many levels. Fast forward to today, and I've been seeing it's, – it's so funny, actually, to see some of the things that people put online because the very same people who argued against letting the voters have a say on abortion just six years ago are the ones who want to put it back on the ballot today. If you look at the roll call um, from the 2018 legislative session, the overwhelming majority of the Democrat Party in both the House and the Senate – voted against letting the voters have a say on the issue of abortion. But they lost, and now they want a do-over, which is exactly what you would expect from the, the, the losers that are the Democrat apparatus in the state of West Virginia at this point. They weren't successful, and now they want to try again. Um, and that's not going to happen. The voters have already spoken. The voters have decided that they want to protect life and subsequently have had two elections um, where they are, they're, we're currently in um, the second election since then, or the third election since then, where they have continued to send overwhelmingly pro-life representatives to Charleston. And so um, I, I think it's just funny um, to hear all of these Democrats who are just clearly sad that they lost, that they want another chance at the, they want another, they want another bite at the bullet. Um, and so it's just ironic. And, and I always just find it funny too, because Democrats 
will always tell you that they want abortion to be a decision between, you know, a woman and her doctor. Um, but honestly, that just polls better than what they really believe, uh, which is abortion up until birth paid for by taxpayers. And so I'm very proud of West Virginia, of West Virginians, and the leadership that we're showing in this Dobbs era to protect life, um, to continue to protect life legally, and then also to um, put our money where our mouth is and invest in these pregnancy help organizations that are empowering women um, to, to choose life for themselves and their families. Good morning, Kayla. This is John Gilstrap. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot or, or uh, push you out of your area of expertise, but what do you think is the difference between West Virginia voters and other places around the country where Republicans are getting pretty badly spanked on the issue of abortion in special elections and such that have happened since the um, Roe was overturned? Sure. I think that's a great question, and I think there are a couple of answers to that. One, I think that West Virginians stand for strong Christian Christian values, we protect the underdog here, right? Like we're an underdog state. And so there's something about protecting um, the underdog, the underdog being a voice for the voiceless that really resonates with West Virginians. Um, and it's something that I really value about this state and that I want to protect in West Virginia. And I hope that the legislature will ensure that those values continue to be protected. The other, the other, the other answer to your question is we're being out spent in massive amounts, by massive amounts of money across the country. And so that's certainly contributing, um, that's certainly contributing to, to some of those elections that you're referring to. I know this year there are several states that are going to be taking up a similar ballot initiative um, to what Ohio had last year. Um, I think Florida is going to be one. Uh, there's talks in Missouri that there may be one. There's an attempt right now um, to get that ballot initiative on the ballot. Nebraska is another one in the talks. So there are several states that are considering it now, but um, I'm really proud that West Virginia decided to um, to act and act swiftly because, again, we value life, we value family, and we value um, the, the culture that we've created here that really is conducive to a pro-life policy. Matt Miller. I look at that and, and hear what you're saying, Kayla, and go back. You mentioned 10 years ago um, when the state was using taxpayer money for abortions. Did we still at that time only have one abortion clinic in the state in the Charleston area? There was one in, a, in Charleston at that point. However, I think it's important to know that abortions were not only performed at the abortion facility in Charleston. They were also performed in, in hospitals. In fact, there were so few regulations on abortions that there really was no direction at where an abortion could be performed. That's how um, unregulated abortion. We didn't even require a doctor to perform abortions in the state of West Virginia at that point. And so, um, yes, there was one abortion at that point. I think in the years, a few years prior to that, there were three. I can't, I can't tell you exactly how long ago that was. Um, but I think that also points to the fact that West Virginians um, are becoming increasingly pro-life, that there was um, less of a need um, for multiple abortion facilities in the state. And um, actually, the fact that that facility, formerly known as the abortion clinic in West Virginia, is no longer performing abortions is actually one of the, the my proudest accomplishments. And I know it's something that's but I know it's, again, not to talk about him again, but I know that's something that Craig Blair has said, too, that he wanted to, to put them out of business, that he wanted to make sure they couldn't continue to prey on vulnerable West Virginians. You know, I always thought the, the most onerous thing about Roe v. Wade was the, the nationalization or the federalization of uh, the, the de abortion debate, saying that states, the individual states, could not make their own decisions about whether or not to allow abortions. And now there's a drumbeat for uh, federal legislation that would outlaw abortion across all 50 states. And to me, that that's kind of row just the in the opposite direction. What are your thoughts on that? Should we see federal legislation across the board that outlaws abortion throughout the United States or should the states be able to make their own decisions? I think that's an excellent question. I'm so glad you brought this up because. There's really a difference between the Supreme Court mandating that abortion on demand um, must be provided throughout the country and legislative action. 
um, put forth by the elected representatives of the people. And so what Roe, what Roe versus Wade did in 1973 was put, West, put the United States in line with countries like China and North Korea at the time um, to provide um, access to abortion at any point in pregnancy for any reason whatsoever. And it took, the, it took that decision out of the hands of the people. The movement for a federal minimum actually still maintains this idea that the people should have a say. And I 100 percent support a federal minimum standard. Um, right now, the talk is 15 weeks. That's where science shows us that, a, that an unborn child can feel pain as early as 12 weeks, definitely by 15 weeks. Um, and so if we don't have a federal minimum standard, what we're going to see is states like California, Maryland, um, Virginia, and these more liberal states throughout the country provide abortion tourism destinations for vulnerable women, um, terminating the lives of children up to nine months. That's the law in California right now. That's egregious. That's what China is promoting, you know, the human rights bastion of China. I, I think we should probably um, probably try to separate ourselves from that. And the other point I just want to make on this, just to sort of tie this up, is that the abortion industry has been preying on women and lying to women for over 50 years now. They want us to believe that abortion is this one-size-fits-all solution to the problems that pregnant women are facing, but that could not be further from the truth because at the end of the day, abortion will never help a woman struggling with addiction find freedom. Abortion will never help a woman um, in home, who, who's experiencing homelessness find a home. It's never going to help a woman who's in an abusive relationship escape her abusive partner. The pro-life movement does that. The pregnancy health organizations that the state of West Virginia is investing in is doing that in, in our state. And I am incredibly proud of what I'm seeing in West Virginia and the commitment from both our elected leaders and the members of our community um, when it comes to protecting life and walking alongside women and supporting them in this decision. Meanwhile, states like California, Maryland continue to prey on vulnerable women. Um, and so um, I hope that I do hope that Congress will act and pass a federal minimum standard um, of, of, of at least 15 weeks. Kayla, is that kind of the biggest shift for pro-life organizations since uh, Roe has gone down in that you can focus your attention maybe more on those help areas as opposed to having to uh, focus it in political ways and fighting abortion? You know, I think it's um, a multi-pronged approach, right? It's a multi-pronged problem, and it's a multi-pronged approach. Obviously, we've talked a little bit about the ballot initiatives that are taking place in states across the country. Um, we're going to continue to try to fight for life um, on, on in, in those battleground states. Um, and then again, at the federal level, trying to protect life with a federal minimum standard. Um, but there is this um, this really a redoubling of efforts. You know, pregnancy resource centers have been around since before Roe versus Wade was issued in 1973, and they've been supporting women since then. And I, what I'm seeing now is this commitment from people um, around West Virginia and around the country who are recognizing that now more than ever, women need support, women need resources. Um, and we have the ability to, to, to point them in the direction of those resources and to walk alongside them so that they know they're not alone. Kayla Kessinger, our guest here on the program. Kayla, is it Kessinger or Kessinger? Kessinger. Jer. But I'll call gotcha. me whatever you want. I'll, I'll answer. I'll call you. I'll it's call just you. not late for dinner. Is that the, is that the quote, I think? <laughs> well, it's eight, not even 8.30 in the morning yet, Kayla. Stop thinking about dinner already. Let's, I know. Let's... I'm already thinking about the stuffed chicken I'm going to make tonight. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. Yeah. What's going on with her? What's your side dishes there? So I think I'm going to make macaroni and cheese and some collard greens, actually. I bought some yesterday, and I've, I've been in the mood for some lately. Right, I'm, can, a, I'm a Southern West Virginia girl at heart. You can talk about dinner, then. That's fine. That sounds pretty tasty. Hey, uh, <laughs> just a, a couple of questions for you here, Kayla. We're short on time, and this may be opening up a, a more complicated can of worms here. But uh, some time ago, I think in, it was in the 90s, uh, probably 30 years ago, my wife's first pregnancy, 10 and a half, 11 weeks in, was a miscarriage and she had to get mm. a dnc uh very yeah. sad very sad day that would have been our first child yeah. right uh mm -hmm. now my concern though as we are tightening abortion laws around the country 
is that similar stories in other states have been told where women in these situations could not get abortions and had to go, because the DNC is effectively that, and had to go to another state in order for this to be carried out. Uh, some say this is an exaggeration. Uh, you're, you're, you're really kind of picking on something that isn't there. However, these are stories that you, you read. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. And my, my concern on tightening these restrictions too strongly is because of these stories is that doctors and their insurance companies react to these things completely and absolutely because the liability already for an OBGYN is pretty severe in terms of the insurance policies here. So for many, they have just simply said, not touching it at all because I don't want to risk, I don't want to risk of being thrown in jail. I don't want to be, I don't want to risk being uh, 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 lambasted uh, by the right wing. I don't want to risk the liability on this. So just not touching it at all. Sorry, can't help you. What's the sure. answer to that? Yeah. So first of all, um, I'm really sorry for your loss. I know that um, this time of year in particularly, we're approaching Mother's Day on Monday, that this is um, a time that can be very difficult for um, women and men who have experienced reproductive grief. And it's something that should not be taken lightly. Um, when, 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 a, when, a, when a mother or a father loses a child, um, whether in pregnancy or beyond, it is absolutely horrendous and heartbreaking. And so I'm very sorry um, that you experienced um, the pain of miscarriage. Um, there are a lot of people in my life who have experienced the same pain, and it's not anything that we should take lightly or um, sort of sweep under, sweep under the rug. With that being said, um, I think it's important to note that there is not a single law in the country that prohibits a DNC being performed um, for miscarriage management, not a single law. Um, it is very important to remember that abortion is legally, when, when we're defining abortion legally, it is the termination of unborn life. Um, the intentional termination of unborn life. And so when um, a family experiences something as painful as a miscarriage, while they are having a DNC performed, it is not legally an abortion. So that's my first answer to your question is that there is no legal prohibition on a DNC being performed um, to care for a woman and a, uh, for a woman who has lost um, her unborn child. Your second concern was that doctors will maybe take this to an extreme, that they just won't touch any of it. Um, And my response to that is, one, um, I think doctors are smarter than that. I think doctors care about their patients. I think doctors um, want to make sure that their patients are protected and, um, and, and will handle that the way that needs to be handled. However, there is a movement throughout the country. Actually, I can't remember what state it was that passed it. I'll find out and I will send it to you. Um, but there are several states right now considering legislation that would provide additional training and education for physicians who would find themselves in that position so that they truly can have the fullest of understanding of what the law permits and what the law um, prohibits. Um, and I really think that's important. I would love to see West Virginia do something similar um, just to provide clarity for the situations that you're you're talking about. But again, I just I, I just I really just want to take a second just to recognize that um, there are many women and men and families who are probably um, going through a really difficult time this week as we approach Mother's Day. Um, because of reproductive grief, whether it was a miscarriage or um, maybe it was an abortion in their past. And so my prayers are with them. And I would encourage all of your listeners that if you do know someone who has experienced reproductive grief, that this would be a really great opportunity to reach out to them, take them to lunch, um, take them to coffee, love on them, just let them know that you're there and that, um, that, you're, that, that you're available if they want to talk. Kayla, thank you very much. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for having me. It's always great to be with y'all. Have a great dinner. Thanks. (laughs) Sounds like you will. Yeah. (laughs)